All right, so thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, everyone, for attending today's session. So uh, let's get started with a brief uh, introduction uh, about the topic. So just a second here. Well, <clears throat> so we are in Global AI Developer Days event, and focus is machine learning and artificial intelligence, of course. So typically, we consider that AI is some uh, model that can be used to uh, automate a system. For instance, we have a self-driving car that can take images uh, using sensors. A machine learning model can use these uh, pictures to make predictions. For example, if uh, within the image, an object is detected like a tree or perhaps a human. Then these predictions are used by the car to make decisions such as turn to the right to avoid the tree or the human. And we uh, refer this wall system as AI. Uh, however, when we develop AI, there might be risks that it can be unfair or simply seen as a black box that makes decisions for humans. Let's analyze another example. There is another model that analyzes uh, people's information like income, nationality, age, and decides whether to grant them a scholarship or no. Human participation is typically limited in those decisions. Uh, they, the, the system defines if the person is, uh, should be granted a scholarship or no. And we don't know why there was a, mis a decision, like why the person was rejected. So this can lead to many potential problems and companies need to define a clear approach to the usage and explainability of AI. Well, responsible AI is a governance framework meant to do exactly that. So again, welcome everyone to uh, my session at Global AI Developer Days. Uh, thank you to organizers for uh, accepting this uh, session. So it's a great pleasure to, to be here. My name is Luis Beltran. I am a Microsoft MVP in Azure AI and Developer Technologies from Mexico. However, I am joining for, from uh, Czech Republic. I am pursuing my PhD at Thomas Bata University in Slin and in topic uh, computer vision, artificial intelligence and engineering informatics. I am a lecturer of, uh, at this university and also in Mexico. Here you have my contact details in case you would like to follow up with this uh, topic or something related with AI, uh, Azure, or uh, mobile application developments with Xamarin or .NET MAUI. They are my favorite topics. OK, so let's uh, get back to our presentation. So it is true that uh, artificial intelligence brings a lot of opportunities to businesses. Uh, they can get a lot of income, but it also comes with an incredible and high level of responsibility because the direct impact that AI has on people's life nowadays has raised considerable questions around the ethics of our machine learning models, trust, legality, and data governance. For example, there is a research by Accenture. They found out that around 35% of consumers trust how organizations implement AI, so that's a low value. On the other hand, 77% of people believe that companies must be held accountable for the 
misuse of AI. So organizations nowadays uh, continue expanding the use of AI to get more benefits, but they should also consider regulations and what steps they need to make sure that the organizations are compliant. And that's where responsible AI comes into play in everyone and everyone is involved. Data scientists, machine learning engineers, stakeholders, and why not, also consumers. Everyone has an ethical, legal, and, res and responsibility around the uh, model usage, development, deployment, and consumption. So they don't negatively affect individuals or uh, groups of people. So in specific terms, Responsible AI is the practice of uh, designing, uh, developing, deploying AI with uh, good intent to empower uh, employees, businesses, and impact in positive, fair, safe, and ethical way, customers and society. As a result, this will enable organizations to build trust and scale AI in more secure way. Models are the product of many decisions by the data scientists and engineers who develop and implement the models. Responsible AI can help proactively guide uh, these decisions toward more beneficial but also equitable outcomes. So it keeps people and their goals at the center of the system design decisions. And it also uh, respects some values like fairness, reliability, and transparency. It is important that we also evaluate and uh, research the machine learning models before their implementations. I will explain this a bit later. Okay, so different companies have prepared or have thought about uh, how to implement responsible AI. One of them is Microsoft. They have developed a responsible AI standard, which is a framework for building uh, these uh, AI systems according to six key principles. Fairness, reliability and security, and safety, sorry, privacy and security, inclusiveness, transparency, and accountability. Microsoft consider, considers that uh, the principles are the foundations of responsible and trustworthy approach to artificial intelligence, especially nowadays, because technology is more prevalent in the products and services that people use every day. So let's talk about these principles uh, with some examples. So first we have privacy. Artificial intelligence systems such as uh, voice tagging, speaker recognition or facial recognition are important nowadays to get uh, access to, to an individual's uh, resources. I can use my, vo my voice to enter some uh, maybe room or to give some commands to my phone or to some device. However, my ID, my face, my voice can be used to breach my privacy and uh, threaten security. In the fact, in fact, uh, nowadays deep fakes are very common and very easy to create. On the one hand, they can be used for uh, fun. Uh, like for example, you can swap your face with uh, uh, the actor's face in some movie 
and you can create a video and how would it be if I acted on, on a specific movie? On the other hand, it can also be used to create bad reputation, create fake news or deep fakes. And it can uh, create, someone can create a video of, of me saying maybe bad, bad words or attacking someone else. And we, we live in a world where viral uh, stuff, viral things are very easy to, 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 to reproduce and everyone will know about it. Perhaps it was true or no, but the damage is done. So AI systems are increasingly being misused in, in, in this domain. So there is a clear need to establish a framework that protects an individual's privacy and security. Uh, yeah, so the idea is to uh, avoid the identification of an individual and some of their data like uh, location, activities, or interests, mainly because of compliance. So for example, uh, here in Europe, the GDPR. So let's uh, take a look at some example. We have some study or uh, several studies. In one of them, we know that 10 participants uh, share their data about location and income. The analysis of uh, aggregated salary data tells us that the average salary of a person in Seattle is uh, 96,000 US dollars. On the other hand, we might have another chart, another analysis, and we observe that 10% of study participants are based in Seattle. If we know that there were 10 people, 10% represents, of course, we know that it represents one person. So we automatically know the salary of that person. So everyone who reviews and identifies this will get information about a specific individual. And perhaps this is something that we don't want. So how can we protect individual data values? We can apply one technique, which is known as differential privacy. It basically adds a statistical noise to the analysis process. The noise ensures that, on the one hand, data aggregations stay statistically consistent with actual data values. It provides some random variation. And on the other hand, it makes it impossible to uh, get a specific information about individuals' values for, for this aggregated data. You can see that in, in this uh, new analysis, we obtain that 9.6% of participants are from Seattle. And the salary average is uh, a different amount from what it was before. So we added some noise, but of course, the, this noise that there are some mathematics involved. Uh, why this value, right? But it is statistically consistent. Now it is not as easy as before uh, to identify the data of a specific person. To uh, enable this uh, privacy in our uh, machine learning models, there are several open source packages. One of them is Smart Noise, which is a project co developed by Microsoft that contains component for building these uh, differential private systems. The idea is that we create analysis 
and we add noise to the source data. And it is quite uh, fair, fair, uh, intuitive to, to use. It supports uh, machine learning model algorithms like linear regression, logistic regression, but it can also work with TensorFlow. And well, why, why, sorry, just a second. while we have uh, a complex mathematics around, this uh, package simplifies the task for you. All you need to know is about an epsilon uh, parameter that you can configure. This value, uh, let's say, governs the amount of additional risk that your data, personal data, can be identified. Basically, this is the uh, factor or amount of noise that you want to apply to every uh, member in the data. As a rule, in lower values of epsilon, you will get the highest privacy, but the accuracy might decrease a bit. On the other hand, high value of epsilon will get you the most accuracy, but the privacy is reduced. So it will be easier to identify someone or it will be similar to the original data. And we can demonstrate this. So here, <clears throat> I already have some notebooks uh, prepared for you. So this is Azure Machine Learning uh, Workspace, but of course you can also use it in normal uh, Jupyter using other technologies. So here for, for this experiment, uh, I installed Smart Noise, so you can just pip install OpenDP Smart Noise, which is the package that I just mentioned. And then I just proceed to load some data. I have a CSV with information of patients. And we know, or, or, or we, we would like to create some model that tells us if uh, they develop uh, diabetes or no. So yeah, in, in this historical data, of course, we, we, we got uh, th this information. So, so we have features like uh, pregnancies, uh, plasma, plasma glucose level, triceps thickness, body mass index, and other data. Please take a look at age and this value, 30.1341, which is the average of the age. There are also other features, but let's focus on this one. The average age of individuals, all individuals is 30.13. Now, uh, so, and this is from the original data, of course. Now, we can create an analysis, a smart noise analysis. We prepare the analysis by providing the data set, which is our original data. And we also specify an array of our columns. After that, we focus on a specific uh, feature like age, and we will consider this one as float value. All right. Then we want to apply differential privacy to a specific feature and a specific aggregation. In this case, we have selected mean value. So mean, we, we want to apply differential privacy mean to our age. And here we specify the epsilon value, the amount of noise that we want to include or add in our original data. So 0 0.1, let's say. We specify the bounds and the uh, individuals, the, the data. After that, we perform the analysis. And we can compare the uh, actual mean, original mean, and the differential privacy uh, mean, private mean. You can observe the actual mean is 30.13, as we saw earlier. And the differential private mean is 30.0.48. And this is the value that we will use for other analysis, for example. right? But you can observe a difference. There is a slight difference, which is not exactly the original data, but something that remains statistically consistent. And 
If, for example, I modify epsilon value and I increase it 0 0.5, now this data will become closer to the actual data. So let's run it again. And you will observe that, yeah, th this value is quite closer, 30.216. 200, and if I move it to one, then it is quite close, right? So because we, we had increased it. So uh, as we increase it, it will be, the behavior is similar to original data. This package also allows us to create some uh, uh, charts, for example, histograms. And the idea here is that we can observe the original data and the differential private information. So here we create differential private histogram. Again, we specify some uh, column like age, the boundaries, and then epsilon value again, let's say 0 0.5. So after we release this analysis, you will observe that we have this chart on blue, the original data, and on yellow or orange, the private data. You might not see it at all. I will try to maximize this, but the charts are slightly different, right? Th there is some a small difference between the, the, the values of, of them. Let's say in this case, the, the, the different categories. So, so yes, you, you can, uh, for example, create this uh, design or, or um, chart around your data. And you can also create differential private covariance, which means the relationship that exists between uh, some features. Let's say that we would like to analyze what happens between age and diastolic blood pressure. Well, from uh, in machine learning, you know that there is covariance uh, uh, method. So when we work with our actual data, we will find that, yes, they are highly correlated. The higher the age, the higher the diastolic uh, blood pressure. And if we apply differential private covariance between both of them with, uh, let's say, some epsilon value, we will find that the differential private covariance is 14, it's still positive and also still a high value. So we see that. Yes, this uh, differential privacy is uh, still, uh, uh, let's say, statistically uh, correlated. Again, if we uh, decrease this value to 0 0.5, we will get the same result, but of course, uh, maybe different value. Okay, well, in this case, it was the same for some reason, but anyways. You can also uh, implement some uh, SQL queries for analysis, right? Uh, but yeah, you, this is another feature, another possibility that you can see. Uh, in, in this case, for example, we obtain the, some analysis about the actual data. So uh, in this case, we, we observe that uh, this person did not develop diabetes, while the second one, yes. Right? Well, actually, this is the differential private data. And what happens with the original information, we observe the same. This person did not, did not develop diabetes, and this one, yes, okay? And we observe that the average age, for example, of uh, the, the group is quite similar. Not exactly the same value, but uh, similar, because the noise was added. So in general, differential privacy is about adding some noise that doesn't affect your uh, results that brings everything consistent, but the data is not exactly the same or the original one. So we explored all these cases already. And this is the differential privacy is what can help you to, um, to uh, consider 
privacy or to protect the individual's privacy. We can move to a fairness principle, uh, which uh, sometimes we, we, our models can uh, encapsulate unintentional bias, and this can lead to unfairness, injustice. In responsible AI, we must detect, mitigate, and reduce unfairness in our models in order to treat everyone fairly and avoiding affecting groups of people in the same context. For example, maybe an AI system uh, provides some guidance on medical treatment, loan applications, or uh, maybe um, uh, financial uh, professional qualifications. The idea is that maybe the, the, the model uh, provides or, or they should make similar recommendations to everyone with similar uh, symptoms, financial circumstances, or professional qualifications in order to build some trust, increase confidence, in the model's predictions. And we, we need to make sure that they don't uh, discriminate against subsets of population, uh, regardless of ethnicity, gender, age, or other factors. Uh, there is, uh, for example, a responsible AI dashboard that we will explain later. But this one includes a fairness assessment component that can help data scientists to evaluate the, if the model is uh, just or no across different groups, uh, which can be sensitive, like age, ethnicity, nationality, and so on. So let's take a look at this one. So again, we can use uh, another open source package known as FairLearn. So, I have this second notebook. Okay, yes. So here we, well, okay, first we install it, install the two component, uh, fairness and further. Then we proceed to train our model the same way that we typically do. So in this case, we take our diabetes uh, data set and we use decision tree classifier for training the model. After that, uh, we might get some statistics, some metrics. Some will be from scikit-learn, like accuracy score, recall score, and precision score, which are quite common. If we want to evaluate the performance or the quality of a model, we typically consider those three. However, we will also uh, check selection rate and metric frame, which come from Fairlearn, Fairlearn uh, package. So let's observe the metrics. And on the first part, we may obtain, well, the accuracy is 89, recall 83%, precision 83. However, we also observe a low selection rate, 0 0.33. OK, we might think that our classes are imbalanced, or maybe there are some other issues. But fair learn can give us can give us a sensitive analysis let's say that we perform this metric frame around age we want to check if uh, there is some uh, unseen bias towards specific groups of age so we perform this analysis and we find out that actually for people over 50 years old, they are uh, highly selected for diabetes. And people younger than 50, they are not selected at all. While this can uh, be a bit true, right? right that uh, maybe uh, as you get older, the probability of uh, developing diabetes is higher, still, this is some kind of bias because the other features, the other characteristics are also important. And perhaps age is not the, 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 the top one, right? 
or, or the one with uh, priority. So we can, uh, uh, yeah, we, we need to mitigate maybe this uh, unfairness because if we if we have let's say more people that uh, use our model, they, maybe they get asked, "What is your age?" Sixty years old, and the rest doesn't care. They will be uh, predicted as they will develop a diabetes, and maybe it is not true at all. So, what can we do? Yes. So there is a dashboard, right, which is the fairness dashboard. Uh, that uh, we can use first also to detect the same information that I just showed you, right? But the idea here is that you can obtain this information maybe with a better, uh, let's say, detail uh, or with a nice chart. So this is a bit uh, like uh, uh, better to, to observe. Yeah, there are two groups. 50 or younger, over 50, and we observe, right, the, the same uh, percentages uh, and also the, the metrics that we obtained earlier. So back, uh, well, yeah, uh, by the way, this uh, dashboard, uh, you, you don't obtain it uh, immediately. First, there is some uh, user interface, some, some wizard, so you just click get started. The analysis detected that there is one sensitive feature, which is age, and these are the groups. After that, you select how you are going to evaluate your models, let's say by recall, which is how many data uh, was correctly classified, right? If there is a true uh, or, or if it is uh, diabetic, how, how many were detected? And, and then we also select fairness, what we want to evaluate. One of the possible evaluation is demographic parity difference, which means that if we have two classes like uh, non-diabetic and diabetic. What? Sorry, sorry. If, if we have yes, uh, this uh, we, we select one label like diabetic people. Okay. From from this from this uh, diabetic people, and we have uh, two groups like people younger and people older than 50 years old. What is the difference between the selection rate of both groups? And after it, this analysis is performed, we find out that the difference is around 40%, right? Because in one group is 30 and in the other one is almost 70. So this is, the, this is a problem. This is an, an issue about the demographic parity. So we identify that uh, our um, uh, data set can be unfair. And what can we do to mitigate it, right? So I will scroll down a bit. And to mitigate the unfairness, right, we can use um, algorithms and also optimizers. So one of the algorithms is a grid search. Grid search, basically, uh, we will obtain different models with different uh, characteristics, different features considered. Maybe we can discard age, or we can discard a body mass index, and other. So it's basically applying feature selection. Uh, the, the idea is, OK, we will create several models. And the best models, we, we will select some uh, optimization constraint. In this case, equalize odds, but there are others. Give me a second. So, uh, so some constraints could be, well, if we consider optimizer like true positive means that we want to minimize the difference in true positive rate between the sensitive groups. But equalize odds means that we want both true and false positive rate to be similar, right? Because, yeah, we, we, we would like to consider both true positive, like for uh, label one, diabetic person, and also for non diabetic. We want that our groups, sensitive, sensitive groups, uh, get similar rate in the different scenarios. Okay, true positive and false positive. But if we want to focus only, let's say, on false positive, we can select that constraint. And after, we uh, select like 
uh, or apply grid search with equalized auth constraint, we can obtain a collection of models. So here we obtain like 20. And now we can uh, check again our, our um, a dashboard. So I will select it from the beginning so you can see. And here we will be able to see what is the, uh, how is fairness going uh, around these two. So again, we select recall, uh, demographic parity difference, right? Or equalized odds. And now we will observe that we get this, uh, uh, let's say, um, dispersion chart. And the idea here is that this uh, bottom right corner is uh, the best which because the recall will be high and the demographic parity difference will be low, right? So it is, it is up to us uh, what we want to uh, prioritize. For example, this uh, member, this model, the diabetes mitigated 18 has low recall, so low uh, accuracy, but the demographic parity difference is small. If we actually check the details, we will observe that now in these two groups, the difference is uh, small. For one group, 99% uh, in selection rate, and in second group, 34%. So it, it, it was an improvement because at the beginning it was, if you remember, 30 and 70, and now is uh, 29 and 34. On the other hand, however, the recall uh, decreased a bit. So of course, this uh, we, we need to find some balance because of course also accuracy recall, they are important besides the fairness of our model. Okay, so yes. And this is what we obtain. OK, so we can move to our next uh, uh, principle, which is uh, transparency. And the idea here is that uh, it is important to be able to understand how machine learning models make predictions. It is important to as data scientists to be able to explain why the model made a specific decision. And it is important also to identify and mitigate bias. If someone, uh, let's say, goes to the bank, they provided information, and they are rejected to get some loan, they will ask why. They, and, and maybe an AI system was used to make this decision. It is necessary that the model gives some insight justifies why the decision was made, why the loan was rejected. So this is known as model interpretability and helps predictions to be explainable and not seen as black boxes that just randomly makes decisions. The idea here is to find uh, what characteristics uh, affect the behavior of a model and why a specific uh, individuals uh, were predicted uh, with some result. So yeah, the model explainers use statistical techniques uh, to calculate these uh, importance of features. And there are two types, global feature importance and local feature importance. They are very easy to understand. Global feature importance uh, quantifies the relative uh, importance of every feature in your data set. So basically, you will know uh, the influence of every feature in the prediction. For example, we might have this uh, binary classification model that predicts the uh, long default risk 
And there are some characteristics like lo loan amount, income, age, and so. And after we apply the, the global importance feature analysis, we find out that income uh, has the most influence. W the income of a person, the salary, is uh, more relevant when making predictions for uh, being uh, accepted for, for a loan. Loan amount, age, marital status come in second, third, and fourth place. They are not as relevant as income. So this is in general for the model. But then we also have second possible analysis, which is the local feature importance. Basically, what is the influence of the features, but only for a specific individual predictions? For example, let's say that uh, I uh, apply for this uh, loan. I want money from the bank. Uh, and then I find out that, well, actually, your uh, proposal was accepted. But what influenced the most was the loan amount. Maybe you ask for some fair amount or low amount, right? And that data uh, affected the, the, the outcome, the decision made by the system. So th this uh, dark blue represents the influence for or support for uh, getting the loan. And you have similar value, but opposite, negative, uh, for support for zero. So yeah, of course, if you, you get uh, 0 0.9, let's say, for accepting, it's the same as negative 0 0.9 for not accepting uh, the, the loan. In second place comes income and, and so. So basically, we find or we can see that for a specific uh, individuals, the influence of characteristics can be can differ from the uh, general uh, features. Let's say it's fine, but the 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 the, the, the let's say what, what you can consider or the relevant part here is that the model you can explain why the decision was made in general or for a specific individuals and how we can actually implement this in our models? Well, there are some packages, for example, interpret community. And I have final uh, demo for this one. So again, we install our package, uh, interpret. And after that, yes, we train another model. Uh, again, decision tree classifier for our diabetes uh, data set. All good. Now, we simply need to uh, create a tabular explainer that you can see here. We apply it to our model. Then uh, we just uh, uh, include every member, that is every uh, um, individual that is, or every patient that is included for training. And we also provide the different columns, right? And also the labels, which are uh, non-diabetic and diabetic. After that, the explainer is ready. And we can use two methods, explain global or explain local. For explain global is as simple as we get this object, uh, global tab explanation, and we just print the importance of every feature and we can observe that for example for our um, data set model pregnancies is the most relevant feature uh, for determining if a person develops diabetes this is the support for a uh, label one in second place age and third place body mass index we can also uh, build some uh, chart around this so uh, here in National Machine Learning Studio, there is uh, this, uh, let's say, uh, option explanations, uh, which is supported after we, uh, we uh, add this tabular explainer. So please observe uh, here in aggregate feature importance. 
focus on the blue marker. Yes, this is the, the, the same information that I just told you. Uh, just give me a second. Yeah, only this. Yeah, oh, oh, sorry. I will just, because, yeah. So it is the same. Pregnancies, most relevant feature, then age, BMI, and so, right? And then we can do uh, evaluate local feature importance. So in this case, we select a couple of uh, patients. We uh, predict, so they will develop diabetes or no. And then we apply explain local method. Then we can see what happens. Uh, we, uh, we, we can, this, uh, is, this is just simple loop, right? So the idea here is that, well, for individual number one, the prediction is non-diabetic and the result is 0 0.33. And in this case, we can observe that, well, the ins serum insulin level was the most relevant feature. This, the, the, the value that uh, was there uh, influenced the result of saying this person is non-diabetic. In second place, age, and third place, freezer thickness, and so on. And the second person also is non-diabetic. But the uh, top feature or which determined this result was the body mass index, right? Second place, diabetes pedigree, and also pregnancies, because every individual has different data. And the uh, uh, important features were this for, for this uh, case, right? And you can also uh, apply the analysis for uh, the, the other label, right? Again, uh, we, we know that the, 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 this person, these people were non-diabetic and we obtained the same result, but negative, okay? So what, what I mean is that, yes, we create our model now. Let's explain it now why these decisions were made. So yeah, it, it is uh, very easy to, to add this uh, explainability. Then we can talk about the other three principles. Uh, there are no demos for this, but uh, they are also important, of course. So reliability. AI systems must be uh, secure, so we can build trust around them. It is important that the system works as originally designed and responds safely to new situations. They must uh, resist intentional or unintentional manipulation. So while we are building the, the model, we should test it. We should validate it. And we must ensure that the system responds uh, safely to extreme cases. The models can uh, degrade over the time. So we need to monitor, track, and improve them um, at some point. We have inclusiveness uh, because, well, the world is uh, quite diverse. Uh, there are peoples, people of uh, different culture, uh, ethnic groups, age, and of course, people with disabilities, nonprofits, or government agencies. And they all need AI systems as much as any other person. So an AI system must be inclusive and uh, in tune with the needs of this diverse ecosystem. When you are creating an AI system, think about inclusion and answer the following questions. Uh, is your system developed to ensure that it includes different categories of individuals? Are there any uh, category of data that you need to be to you need to handle to ensure that they are included? For example, in computer vision, does your data set include uh, different uh, ethnic groups or only Caucasian people? We, we tend to do that. So from, from, from there, of course, there is some bias that it will only detect people from Caucasian groups. 
So this is important to, 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 to consider in computer vision, in uh, speech to text, text to speech, and other uh, fields of, of technologies. And finally, we have accountability. The people who design and implement an AI system need to be held accountable for actions and decisions. And this is especially important as we move through um, autonomous systems. The organizations should consider to establish, let's say, some uh, board or review body internal that uh, provides some information, guidance on the development and implementation of AI systems. For example, back to our original uh, question, do you remember autonomous car? And what happens if this autonomous car uh, causes an accident? Who is responsible? The owner of the car, the driver, the company, the creator of the AI algorithm? So it is important to consider where, where is the responsibility of every actor involved around this. So, well, these were the six principles and maybe some uh, recommendations as a matter of conclusion. And if there are questions, I would be uh, happy to, help to try to answer them. So, well, yeah, if your AI system generates metrics, it is important to show them and how they are tracked or used. The AI system can be can make mistakes, so it is important to in, to inform our users so they set they, they can set an expectation. Uh, it is also good that they uh, pr provide some uh, visual information around the user context. Uh, for example, if a person tries to find a uh, I don't know, some place to stay. But, well, the system must return hotels nearby, right? Near the destination or near wh where the person is. Also consider uh, ignoring some uh, undesirable features that might uh, produce some bias. Make it easy to edit or refine a model. So it can be corrected. And finally, uh, explain why the system has made some specific decision. And last but not least, the feedback of the user is also important. So ask your users for about the interaction with the AI system. Of course, this will bring benefits to companies. It will uh, for example, uh, help to build trust among users if, if your model is transparent and also explainable. It will create opportunities and it will ensure that personal and sensitive data is never used in an unethical way. So, thank you very much for your time. And please, if there are any uh, questions, I will be more than glad to answer them. So. Yeah, this was my presentation about towards responsible AI.